is my distinct privilege to welcome David Meltzer. Right now, he is a stranger to our industry, but I have a feeling we are gonna start a trend and you're gonna see a lot more of him in the next months and years. He is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing and formerly served as the CEO of the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency. Dave has been recognized by Variety Magazine as their Sports Humanitarian of the Year and awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. And to support his life's mission, he provides one thing, value. Here's a little bit about his mission. My personal mission, not only in life, but here today, is simply to empower you, to empower others, to be happy. Today we have an extraordinary opportunity because we can reach about one eighth of the world and change the world in one simple day. If I can empower you, or at least a thousand of you today, in order to empower another thousand people, to empower another thousand people to be happy, 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000 is one billion people, about an eighth of this universe. An eighth of the world can be empowered to be happy, and there's nothing more important in life than to be happy, and I'm gonna teach, through my journey, lessons of happiness, it's really simple, of how to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. My definition of happiness is really simple. It's the enjoyment of the consistent, everyday, persistent, without quit, pursuit of your potential. And there's one thing that I know. Happy people don't have disease. They don't destroy, right? They don't have to, they're amazing. P happy people don't do bad things. Number one, you have to be happy to give it to other people. And if you're not feeling happy, then go ask for help. Ask for help, ask somebody, can you please help me? This is what I need to be happy. But today I came with expectation to, to like feel that energy today. Cause I just was like, if I could just get here to listen to your story today, you know, that would inspire me. I just really want to say thank you, you know? That's why I came back. Cause it was just in me just to come back to Lisa say thank you. You know, um, you might not have been where I'm at right now, but you know, your story still inspired me regardless. All of you live in the world of more than enough, with me and through me. And so if all of us can live with gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effective communication, if all of us can consistently, every day, persistently, without quit, enjoy the pursuit of that blessing, that potential, that truth, we can manifest everything we desire. And if I can empower you to be happy, to empower others to be happy, that's what makes me happy. Your feet and welcome to the stage, Mr. David Meltzer. Thank you. Thank you everyone, I appreciate it so much. What a pleasure it is to be here. I wanna thank Jen, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, I like to start with what life's about. And it's really simple, life's about lessons. The lessons will keep on coming until you learn them. It's that simple. But there's one thing I've learned about lessons, and that's that you will forget every lesson you've ever learned. But you've been blessed with the power to access those lessons, even lessons that you may not have learned yet at any time. So I've learned by speaking around the world, there's two types of people that I speak with. Ones who write down everything I say, which I appreciate, and others that don't write down anything I say. The irony of that is that both groups of people will actually learn the same amount of things. The difference is what you write down, you can later on access. And as you know, being in the IT world, that information is so great and so abundant that it's the access and security of that information that actually carries the value of the information. So the first lesson that I like to teach when I talk is to write down or reposit or deposit the lessons that resonate with you. 
Don't write down any more or any less. If it resonates with you at your frequency, go ahead and figure out and write that down or type it down or sketch it down. But more importantly than taking those lessons that resonate with you from me is create a system to access the lessons. Your life will change. So we don't want to forget those lessons that intuitively, intellectually, and inspirationally attach or connect to us. So create a system to access that information. Uh, you will then carry more power of these lessons and be able to teach them to others within the context of my mission, which is pretty clear to empower you to empower others to be happy. Now, I define happiness as the enjoyment of the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your potential. Not somebody else's, not what's missing, not what you don't have, but your own potential. And in that pursuit, I have found three things that make people happy on earth today. Those people that make a lot of money to help a lot of people and enjoy that pursuit, have fun doing it, are happy. So my objective is to help you understand the values behind making a lot of money, helping a lot of people and having a lot of fun, and also the daily practices that I have found through my journey to help you do that. Anybody here want to make a lot of money? Good. Anybody want to have a lot of fun? How about help other people? Perfect. You're in the right place. I'll start with my journey to help you understand how I came up with the values and the daily practices. And it started when I was born in Akron, Ohio. Anybody from Ohio? There we go. O-H. I-O. Got it. There we go. <laughs> it's a great place to be from. Um, <laughs> there you go. The Soapbox Derby. Uh, Akron, Ohio is exactly where I'm from. My dad left when I was five, and my mom was a single mom, a second grade teacher, who raised six children, five boys and one girl, and she worked two jobs. I always say, I don't, I don't listen to my mom still today. I was just with her for Mother's Day, and I told her, I really don't listen to you, but mom, I watch you, and I have for years, and I want my children to watch me. And, uh, sorry, I'm a mama's boy, but I watch my mom, and she worked two jobs. Second grade teacher, packed our dinner into a paper bag, went into a country squire station wagon, and then filled up turnstiles with greeting cards at convenience stores, just so we sometimes could get food stamps to eat. But regardless of our financial situation, all six of her children were extremely happy. She uh, taught me some great parenting skills. My mom was a black belt in the martial arts. She didn't look like it. She looked like your typical mom of six, about five feet tall. Uh, she was a third degree black belt uh, in the martial art of guilt. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the great parenting skills that I learned uh, that was very powerful. Um, and the other was simply to wake up early. One of the common denominators that I find is not necessarily people w that wake up early are more productive, accessible, and gracious with their time, but people understand sleep are far more productive, accessible, and gracious with their time. And I know in the IT industry, a lot of people don't wake up early, but they still have to understand that a third of your life is spent sleeping, and that most people tragically go to bed at night and wake up more tired than they went to sleep. That makes no sense. In fact, tonight when we all go to dinner, if we were all leaving after two hours of a delicious dinner and all of us looked at each other and said, man, I'm hungry, we would think something was wrong. But every morning, most people wake up and say, oh, I'm tired, more tired than I went to sleep. So we have to understand sleep in itself. And my mom understood that, so she woke us all up at 5 a.m. She also knew that by waking us up at 5 a.m., that no matter how much we tried to get in trouble, that we couldn't stay awake for trouble. <laughs> now, my mom also used that guilt. She had a saying. Some of your parents may have had a similar saying, being in the IT world or being engineers, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, or failure. Uh, that was my mom's motto. She believed the fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school. Um, <laughs> and so my siblings really adhered to my mom's lessons. Now, I had a different journey. I had a different vision for my life because the only time I wasn't happy 
was when I would catch my mom crying over financial stress. Nothing else really seemed to bother her other than when a car broke down or she couldn't afford summer camp or some other opportunity, and I'd catch her crying. It still chokes me up to think about it. And I'd say, from the time I was five years old, I'm gonna be rich. I wanted to be rich to buy my mom a house and a car because I felt if I could just buy her a house and a car, then she would be happy all the time and we would be happy all the time. I lived in Akron, Ohio, but what I really lived in was the world of not enough. No matter what it was, I was a victim and I looked at everyone else and said, why don't I have that? Why can't I have that? If I only had that, I would be happy. And so I set forth on a journey, luckily, to consistently, persistently pursue my potential. And I learned to enjoy it. Now, like many people, especially young people, five, six, seven, eight, 18, I picked the wrong trajectory. I wanted to be a professional football player. Um, most people laugh harder when I say that. <laughs> You guys are much more polite than most audiences. <laughs> it's okay, I get it. <laughs> I look in the mirror every day <laughs> and I don't see anyone in the NFL that looks like this. I see people who own the teams that look like this, and <laughs> but I don't see anyone that plays. But anyway, that's what I decided to pursue. And luckily, despite what everybody else thought in my life from the time I was seven years old and played football, people who laughed at me, scoffed at me, and made fun of me, by the end of the season, every season, they would applaud me. And it continued from Pop Warner to junior high school to high school to college. And I remember my freshman year thinking, man, I did it. I'm gonna be a professional football player. I was the fastest one on my college football team. They put me at the bullet. I weighed 147 pounds, five foot seven. And I remember distinctly on that very first play saying, this is it. I'm once again gonna show everybody that I can do this. And I put in the work. I carried that football since the time I was five years old. I did everything I could to reach my potential. I'm flying down the field and I get past everyone and I hit the ball carrier, my very first kickoff, and the next thing I know, I'm flying backwards and backwards onto my back and the ball carrier stepped on me and kept on running. Now, I also remember lying on my back thinking, doctor, lawyer, or failure. <laughs> my mom's words were ringing true that maybe I picked the wrong profession to buy my mom a house and a car. Now, later on, I found out the guy who ran me over, his name was Christian Okoye. Uh, <laughs> obviously, some of you know him as the Nigerian nightmare. Uh, I was a freshman, he was a senior. The next year, he was the AFC Player of the Year. Um, needless to say, I will tell you even today, as you hear my journey, the closest I've come to reaching my potential was to be an average Division III college football player. That was the closest today still I've come. Now, I've, pick in, I've picked different trajectories, and it may seem that my potential I've reached in certain areas of my life because of it, but I will tell you that if I could have that same years every day with the same inspiration, I would even be further than I am today in my journey of empowering others to be happy. So I decided after that season of football that I'd be a doctor, I was pre-med, I went to go visit my brother, and he was a doctor, in the hospital, and I looked around, and I said to him the very first thing, man, I hate hospitals. <laughs> He's like, you what? I said, dude, I hate hospitals. He said, you're gonna be a doctor. I said, yeah, I'm not gonna be a hospital doctor, I'll be a sports doctor. I was 18 years old. This is really important because I see it so much today in every profession. And it was the greatest lesson that I've ever learned still today. My brother said, you know that you need to be in a hospital to be a doctor, even a sports doctor. And I was like, really? He said to me, you might want to write this one down if it resonates with you. David, be more interested than interesting. Most people live their lives like I was living mine, like a tube. Food in, food out living my life like the myth of Sisyphus, every day enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential, rolling the boulder to the top of the hill, just have it roll back down to the bottom of the hill. 
because I wasn't paying attention to and giving intention to the coincidences I wanted in my life. I wasn't more interested than interesting. So from that point on, I started practicing being interested. My mission in branding someday, anybody seen the Dos Equis guy? The world's most interested, most interesting man, right? I wanna have a commercial with me saying, Dave Meltzer once asked 100 open-ended questions just to see how he could be of service or value to someone. The world's most interested man. And I think that's a better way to be and it's really served me well and served others in the same respect, extremely well. So I decided if I couldn't be a doctor, couldn't be an NFL superstar, that maybe I'd be a better lawyer. Now usually when I say I thought I'd be a lawyer, nobody laughs. It makes perfect sense looking at me. <laughs> and I can see why too, because I became a lawyer and everyone looked like me. <laughs> um, but I decided that I would be more interested than interesting because my objective was to make a lot of money to buy my mom a house and a car. That was my objective. So I went ahead by paying attention and giving intention to the law schools, choosing a law school that hired and had the highest paid graduates, which was oil and gas litigation. So I purposefully, right, my thoughts about my purpose are my purpose, so instead of just going through the motions and going to Harvard or Stanford or Georgetown for law school, I went to Tulane University because they had the top maritime law program, taught international law, civil and common law, and had the most amount of graduates that went to the oil and gas sector, let alone oil companies, so they had the highest paid first year graduates. That's being intentional. And lo and behold, I graduated and got a job as an oil and gas litigator. And it paid, in 1992, it paid $150,000 a year plus bonuses. That was a lot of money in 1992. But one of the things that I've learned about being interested, not interesting, is I always kept my options open, knowing that my objective was to buy my mom a house and a car. And in 1992, they had this new sector of business called technology. They created this new thing. It was .edu originally, and then they created .com. It was called the internet. Some of you may have remembered this thing. Well, I got offered a job in the internet in 1992 selling legal research on the internet. So that job was a sales job. I think it had a forty or $60,000 salary, but the comp plan was at $250,000 a year. I was 24 years old, and I wanted to be rich to buy my mom a house and a car, so I decided I'd better ask my mom what job to take, and I asked my mom, what should I do, mom? I got this oil and gas litigation job that pays this, or this sales job in the internet that pays this. Without blinking, you know what my mom said. David, you got to be a real lawyer. <laughs> This internet thing, it's a fad. It's never gonna last. <laughs> she said the same thing about wireless. She said the same thing about Web3. Same thing about blockchain, crypto, and NFTs. It's never gonna laugh. <clears throat> Another great lesson I learned from this, because I am a mama's boy, as you can tell, I can barely speak about my mom without choking up, is just because somebody loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. And I see so many people of all ages make this mistake. Because there's two types of people in the world. There's ignorant people and ignorant people. That's it. You don't know what you don't know. Now, most people are ignorant, arrogant people. They don't know what they don't know, but they're so afraid of it that they pretend like they know what they know, especially to the people that they care most about. That's a very dangerous scenario and circumstance because we end up hurting the people that we care most about because we are so afraid, as most parents know, we are far more afraid for our children than we are for ourselves. Therefore, we fall into ignorant arrogance and tell them stuff that we don't know because we think we're protecting them. It happens all the time. But there's also ignorant, humble people that admit that they don't know what they don't know and will help participate in the decision making as well as the journey to help find people that do know what you need to know, for example, about sales or the internet or oil and gas law. The easiest way to get to where you wanna be, find someone that's already there, ask them for directions. 
It's that simple. So I learned at a very young age to make my own decision. Not to discredit my mom, but one of my first demos as I took the internet job was to the Supreme Court of the United States. 24 years old, presenting Westlaw to the Supreme Court, and Justice Scalia, who is later on passed, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Meltzer, I'm sorry, we're not going to be implementing Westlaw because nobody will ever do research on the internet. You need books. <laughs> I met him years later and told him the story. He said, you don't tell people that, right? <laughs> You're gone, bro, and I'm still telling everybody I can. <laughs> Ignorant arrogance. Ignorant arrogance. So I went ahead and took that job. Nine months out of law school, I was a millionaire. I bought my mom a house and a car. Terrific thing. One of the happiest days of my life. The problem with that circumstance is, it confirmed something that would later be a tragedy or a bigger lesson in life, that I truly believed that money bought love and happiness. And everything that happened to me over the next 10 years confirmed that money bought love and happiness in my mind. If I wasn't happy, I'd buy more things. If I still wasn't happy, I'd buy different things. If I still wasn't happy, I'd buy things to impress people. If I still wasn't happy, I'd buy things to impress people I didn't even like. And I felt as if I was happy. Three years after I took my first job, I just turning 26 years old, we sold the company in 1995 for $3.4 billion. That's 1995. Billion was a lot of money in 1995. Once again, confirming money buys love and happiness, put my life into a different trajectory. I later went to the Silicon Valley, worked in Web 2.0 in the wireless space, uh, transcoding internet onto WAP phones, dropping off the ESQ, which my mom was super pissed about because she used to lie to everyone and say, my son's a corporate lawyer, so I used to have to keep the ESQ. I'm like, give him your card. He's a corporate lawyer. <laughs> Went there, learned about raising money on Sand Hill Road, made and built relationships, and by the time I was 30 in 1999, I married my dream girl. I met my dream girl when I moved from Akron, Ohio to San Diego. I was nine years old. I remember looking out the window and seeing this gorgeous girl skateboarding by my house at nine, and my heart just sunk. So by the time I got into sixth grade camp, we went to elementary school together, I built up enough nerve to ask my best friend, Robbie, to ask her to go steady with me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, she said no. Tell him to ask me himself, and of course, he embarrassed me in front of everyone and screamed, dude, she said no. <laughs> so I decided, because I was in love with her, that the best way to show that would be to throw an egg at her. <laughs> I hit her in the back of the head. I then decided in seventh grade to tease her even further and throw rocks at her and ask why her friends were prettier than her. Still to this day, my wife doesn't believe that I was in love with her. You all get it. You know that I was, because you might have a 12-year-old. In fact, my favorite thing to tell my daughters when they turned 12 and some boy was picking on them, I would say, be careful, you could end up marrying him. In fact, my favorite thing when my wife moved in with me before we got married was she had this strange look on her face and I said, what's the matter? She said, if somebody would have told me when I was 12 that I'd marry you and be in love with you, I would have killed myself. <laughs> like, this is starting off well. <laughs> anyway, there I am at 30, living in Rancho Santa Fe, Homes, cars, planes, anything that I ever dreamed of, and I was married to my dream girl. And I get a present in the mail for my 30th birthday as I'm living high in the world of what I call the world of just enough for me, where everything was a trade and negotiation. Still a scarce world that many wealthy people live in, buying things you don't need to impress people you don't like. A very empty world of what I call illusionary happiness, fulfillment, person, uh, purpose, and passion. But unbeknownst to me, in arrogant ignorance, I thought I was extremely happy. And my dad, who hadn't really talked to me in much time, sent me my first birthday present in 20 years. I immediately opened up this big box. I was so excited, and it was a sport coat. And I put it on, and I started to cry. My wife's like, what's the matter? I said, it fits me. My dad actually cared enough to know my measurements, and I immediately opened it to see if it says, especially made for David Meltzer, or maybe Armani. And he had torn out all the pockets. I went from complete bliss that I was going to 
have a relationship with my father, no matter what anyone says, no matter what your father does or doesn't do for you or to you, everybody wants to have a relationship with their father. I was so disappointed and so upset. I called him and I said, Dad, why are you punishing me? He said, so what are you talking about? I said, you sent me a birthday gift. I can't even use it. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you tore off all the pockets. I can't wear the jacket. He said, well, it's not for wearing. I said, what's it for? He said, I want you to hang it in your closet. I want you to remind yourself every single day that you can't take anything with you when you're gone. I'm worried about you. You're just like me. Money doesn't buy love or happiness. I'm worried about you. I wish I was ready to hear that. Yes, he planted a seed, but I wasn't. So, of course, at 30 years old, being an amazing Midas, an amazing person, a great mama's boy, I told my dad that I hated him, that I was nothing like him, that he was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, overseller, back-end seller, and I never wanted to talk to him again, and I hung up the phone. Six years later... I was now running the world's most notable sports agency. So I went from running Samsung's phone division at 30, by the way. We had the first smartphone. It was called a convergence device. It was a Windows C device. I was working with Bill Gates and Googs at Microsoft and, you know, engulfed in this great technology. By the way, people told me, if you look it up, it's called the PC-ePhone. Pretty clever, right? Merging a laptop and a phone together. Uh, but... Uh, People told me it was too big and too expensive. Uh, no, I was just too early, <laughs> about 30 years too early. Um, but anyway, I was running that. Now, six years later, I'm running Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. They made the movie Jerry Maguire about our firm. So not only was I a multimillionaire, not only was I married to my dream girl, not only did I have three daughters under the age of eight who were healthy, happy, and gorgeous, but I had access to things that even billionaires didn't have access to. I could go to the Super Bowl on the sidelines. I could go back to the cabins at the Masters. I could go to all the award shows behind stage as a VIP. And six years later, I wanted to take my best friend, Rob, the same Rob from the fourth grade, the sixth grade, that asked my wife to go steady for me. He had remained my best friend through all of this journey of mine. And so I said, Rob, I want to take you to the Masters. We're going to go fly private, Wayne Gretzky, Warren Moon, Joe Montana. We're going to go back to the cabins with Curtis Strange. Please let me take you. And he looked at me in this strange look. I'll never forget. And I'm like, what? He goes, I can't go. Rob, are you kidding me? You love golf. You told me you dreamed to go to the Masters. I go to the Masters like, no, like none other. <laughs> Now I know who listens to the marketing of the masters. He said, I, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't go with you. I'm like, why? He said, because I don't like who you hang out with and I don't like what you're doing. There's a book called Don't Take Yes for an Answer. Well, I've been taking yes for an answer for over a decade. Everybody around me, you're Midas. Yes, 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 yes. Rob was the first one in over a decade to say no. And I looked at him and I said, Rob, I am not doing what those other guys are doing. Just come with me. He said, David, you can lie to me all you want, but I'm worried about you because you're lying to yourself. I decided that I'd tell Rob that I hated him <laughs> to F off and he wasn't a, a real friend. And I left him there. Two weeks later, my life would change forever. I'd ask my wife if I could go to the Grammy Awards with a rapper named Little John. Uh, some of you may exactly, yeah. Uh, John was a client and a friend of mine. My wife said, I really don't think you should go. You're not paying attention to your work. You're not paying attention to your family. And you're partying way too much. I'm really worried about you. I don't think you should go. So I lied to her. Went to the Grammy Awards. Came home at 5.30 in the morning, a complete disaster. And there she was waiting for me. And I said, hey. She goes, you... You are not a rock star. And I looked at her and I said, I may not be, but I sure feel like one. And then she woke me up and said, I'm not happy. I'm leaving you. And you better take stock in who you were and what you want to become or you're going to be dead. And I don't want to be here with your daughters to see that. I'm leaving. I wasn't ready to hear it, so I told her, are you kidding me? 
How dare you talk to me this way? Who do you think made all this happen? I hate you. F you. And I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning even more mad, thinking about how I could steal her happiness, her joy, figuring out what lawyer I could call to take everything from her. I remember specifically feeling the lowest that I've ever felt in my life. Then I looked over in my closet, and there was that jacket. That jacket, I hadn't seen that jacket in years, and it was staring at me. It was calling me. And I looked at that jacket, and I said, oh, I don't hate my father. I don't hate my best friend, and I certainly don't hate my wife. I hate myself. I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a manipulator, an overseller, a back-end seller. And I need to take stock in who I was, who my mom would be proud of. I remember still when we were yelling at each other, my wife and I, that night, she goes, imagine if your mom knew everything that you were doing. Imagine what your mom would think of you. And my heart just sunk. I wanted to be who my mom set me forth to be. I wanted to take stock in someone that she could be proud of. And so I sat the whole day in tears thinking about four values that I live by and I've practiced for 16 years. The first was gratitude, simple gratitude. It amazes me today with all the videos and TV shows and movies and things that I do, how many people will tell me, Mr. Melcher, you changed my life. I say thank you before I go to bed and when I wake up. It's amazing how just saying thank you before you go to bed and when you wake up will change your life. But even more amazing to me is the amount of coherence that it takes to be grateful. What does coherence mean? To remember and to do. We all have such great attention and intention, but we forget to do it and we don't do it. You realize that I haven't met one person on earth that will argue with me that gratitude is not the most powerful thing to change your life. It's free and it takes 0.1 seconds. I've studied quantum physics, metaphysics, and physics, and they all, they all confirm the fact that gratitude is the highest vibration or frequency that will change your life, elevate your perspective in anything and everything to find the light, the love, and the lessons. And if you can reconcile gratitude with time and figure out what feeds you the most, it will even have an exponential value in your life instead of finding that which bleeds us, which most people spend too much time on things that bleed them, people that bleed them because they can't reconcile time to distinguish. Is it worth finding the light, the love, and the lessons in you by being grateful? You're only given 24 hours of man-made constructive time a day. Utilize it by reconciling time and change the relativity of time by doing so in the context of gratitude by finding the light, the love, and the lessons in the most important things to you. So gratitude itself, here's the sad, saddest thing, right? I'm on the Transformational Leadership Council with some pretty big thought leaders like Bob Proctor who passed away or Jack Canfield, John Asaroff, uh, Mary Morrissey, Mark Victor Hansen, and the list will go on, Deepak and Sadhguru. They all agree with me. Simplest, easiest, least expensive way to change your life is simply to say thank you before you go to bed and when you wake up. Anybody agree? How many of you think you can say thank you for 30 straight days? I travel the whole world, speak in front of millions of people. Everybody always raises their hand. Here's the saddest part. By tonight, half of you won't say thank you. By tomorrow morning, another half of us won't say thank you. And within three days, almost all of us won't say thank you. Now, everybody on earth agrees that gratitude is the most powerful thing on earth. It's free and it takes 0.1 seconds. Then why aren't we saying thank you? because we don't have the enjoyment of the consistent, persistent pursuit of our potential. We get in our own way. We are not disciplined in the good behaviors that we know are going to create an exponential result in our lives as in this short amount of time as 30 days. So I want you to take a lesson about what's most important to you of these values and practice them. Every day, let them compound the same as money. Let them compound in their behavior. Good behavior compounds the same as bad behavior. The only difference is when we try to set forth by having good behavior every day, we think we should have instant results. So we quit when we don't. Bad behavior, on the other hand, we don't ever expect to have a, a, a result. So it's usually too late when we start seeing the result of our bad behaviors. 
So by enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential with these values, we're going to accelerate the compounding of the behavior, which will give you an exponential result, which hopefully will be to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. In other words, live the majority of your life in happiness, only spend minutes and moments outside of that perspective, outside of gratitude. The second value that I wrote down, the second value that I wrote down is forgiveness, empathy. So gratitude gives us perspective. What does forgiveness give us? Peace. See, most people love living their life at dis-ease. They live their life at dis-ease. Forgiveness gives us ease. It shifts the entire paradigm of why we're here. Most people want to be more wealthy, more happy, more worthy, instead of realizing I am happy, I am healthy, I am worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? What am I doing to be at dis-ease? Forgiveness is the fastest way to put yourself at peace, at ease. There's only one person to forgive, of course, yourself. You can't give what you don't have, which is why my motto is to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. Most people don't look within to see what they can give without. They don't receive to give. They give to receive. You can't give what you don't have. I've shifted the entire, entire paradigm of giving through forgiveness. Most people live their life and they appreciate what they have. That expands it. When you appreciate something, it adds value. If your home is appreciated in the last three years, it's up in value, you've added value. Most people are in the intention of giving it away. Now, giving to me means Exiting, acknowledgement, acquiring the knowledge of what I have by losing it, having it stolen from me, manipulated, or me purposefully giving it away. It doesn't matter. It has the same result. When something is removed from my possession, from my accumulation, I acknowledge what it has. I've acquired the knowledge. It's the only way to acquire the knowledge. Therefore, forgiveness has to interplay to keep us at ease, not to be afraid that we lost something, not to feel like we lost something, or... Somebody else has lost something. If you appreciate what you have and acknowledge it, you've expanded your vessel. You've expanded your capacity, just like the universe, right? The universe isn't a zero-sum universe. It's constantly what? Expanding, growing, and accelerating. What do most people have a problem with and why they don't achieve what they're achieving? Does anybody know the biggest problem? I'm going to turn my Q&A on you. Does anyone have an idea of the biggest problem? I'll tell you what it is. We don't like to receive. We don't like to receive. We don't like to ask because we feel like we're taking away from someone, that somehow we're putting them in a disadvantageous position or in our own humility that we're somehow inferior because we need help. Appreciate what you have, acknowledge it, but if you don't ask for more, your vessel will dissipate and dissolve. My mom's a classic example of this. She's turning 80 years old and she has given away everything. She's appreciated everything. She's one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. She's given it all the way. It's been manipulated from her, stolen from her. She's lost it. And here she is at 80 years old because she's never asked for more. And that vessel has dissipated and dissolved to the point where now she needs to ask for help. An exact position that she didn't want to be in. If she would have learned that it's a value-add universe that we live in, and there's more than enough of everything for everyone, that we don't live in a world of victims, of not enough, where everything happens to me, we certainly don't live in this world of just enough, where I'm buying things I don't need to impress people I don't like or giving to receive, but instead, we live in a world of abundance, of more than enough, of infinity, more than enough of everything, and it takes faith to believe that. It takes faith to believe that when we ask for help, that we're adding value to the person that we're asking for. Even though simply, if I ask you for help, you'll feel good. You'll feel more valuable. It's unbelievable to me that, gosh, why didn't you ask me for help and then we don't ask anyone for help? Oh, it would be my pleasure to help you. You actually are taking note that I may be able to sit in a situation that you want to be in and you are complimenting me, you're adding value to me, you are increasing the world by asking me for what I have. But yet we don't do it. That's why asking is so important. 
I know there was a young man who's doing the video today and his father came up to me at his speech and said, can you help my son? He's an entrepreneur. And my first piece of advice is, oh, great. Tell him to ask for help. I'll be the first one to volunteer help. Easiest, simplest way, in person, on the phone, via email, social media, traditional media, ask, 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 ask. Pray with faith. The whole understanding of these values of gratitude and forgiveness is that what? There's something bigger than me that loves me more than my mom. It's that simple. If you can believe or do believe, regardless of your dogmatic religion, your philosophies, your spirituality, or any emotional attachment that you have, if you can believe, whatever you define it as, that there's something bigger than you, an omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful source that loves you more than your mom, it's unbelievable how your life will run. It reminds me of when I was three years old. I went to go reach out and touch a hot stove. Now, I just spent Mother's Day with my mom and my wife, and my wife said, you know what your problem is, David? Your mom never hit you. <laughs> and I said, that's not true. When I was three, I went to go reach out and touch a hot stove, and my mom slapped the crap out of my hand and screamed at me, no. And I remember thinking to myself, Oh my gosh, what did I do? Why am I being punished? And I started to cry and I asked my mom, why are you punishing me? And she immediately hugged me and said, I'm not punishing you, I'm protecting you. I'm promoting you. How easy it to be abundant, to live in a world of more than enough, to ask for help when you know you're being protected and promoted at all times. So if you don't get the job you think you're supposed to get, if you don't have the money that you deserve to have, if you have the wrong partners, the wrong spouses, something happens in your life, realize that you're being protected and promoted. It's just a hot stove. You just don't know any better because you're ignorant. Be ignorant and humble and say thank you. Forgive yourself. And then third, be accountable. Accountability is different than liability. Liability is blame, shame, and justification. So if you're sitting at a stoplight and someone's texting and they hit you from behind, there's still liability. There's state and federal laws, traffic laws, all types of insurance that has to be dealt with in the liability of blame, shame, and justification for the damages that occurred to you or to the vehicle. But you're accountable. What is accountability? You should be asking, what did I do to participate in this? I used to say, what did I do to attract it? And then realize that's not right. That's living in a scarce world that somehow I did something and I'm being punished for it. No, what did I do to participate in it? And most importantly, what am I going to learn from it? Remember, lessons, life's about lessons. Pain, setbacks, failures, mistakes keep happening until you learn the lesson. The biggest misuse of time are between problems and solution. Time is defined between cause and effect. So we want to put our attention and intention on what? The cause that then diminishes the amount of time for the effect or the outcome. Too many people live their life trying to put attention and intention on an outcome. So they'll say, I'll be happy when I buy my mom a house in a car. I'll be happy when I get there. I can't wait to get there. Oh, the restaurant, I can't. All of it onto the outcome. So if we all decided today that we're going to drive from Orlando to San Diego and half of us are in one group saying, I can't wait to get to San Diego. We're going to have such a good time with David at his beach house, my favorite Mexican restaurants right on the block. I can't wait to get there. How long is it going to take? I can't wait. And the other half of us put our attention and intention on the cause. What do we need to get there faster? What's the fastest vehicle? Should we pack our food? Is there a porta potty? Whatever it is, what's the best app to use for directions? Two things will occur to the group that puts their attention and intention onto the cause. One, most of the time, but not always, in man-made constructive time, you'll get there faster. It's more efficient, effective, and statistically successful to put your emotions and attention on causes, not outcome. But regardless of who gets there first, those people that put their attention and intention on the cause will say, wow, that went fast. Those people that put their attention and intention and emotion on an outcome will say that took forever. The relativity of time reconciled with man-made constructive time. So many people live their life attaching their attention and intention and emotion on an outcome and wondering why it takes so long to get there instead of on the causes. Quit misusing your time. Be accountable for your time. Ask yourself, what am I doing to participate in this and what am I supposed to learn there to get faster? 
to do it better. Enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of that potential. And then finally, the last value. The last value is effective communication. Now, 16 years ago when I sat on my bed crying all day thinking about these values and how I was going to practice these values of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication, I thought that I needed to effectively communicate with my dad, my best friend Rob, and my wife. Little did I know that that paradigm shift was far greater in the effective communication because I couldn't give what I don't have. And when I realize what I'm connected to and through, that the first connection or effective communication every day was with source so that I could be a greater resource to other people and effectively communicate through what? Inspiration. Through intuition, intellect, and inspiration, I could clear the interference. I decided that day that I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? I'm going to use my free will in order to determine what I'm doing to interfere with it. And I'm going to create practices every day to exponentially aggregate my behavior to create the results that I want faster because that's what creates happiness. And I decided the three results that I was looking for in my life was one, I wanted to make a lot of money, to live in abundance, a world of more than enough. I'm tired of limiting myself. I wanted to live in a world of value add of more than enough money for everyone. Two, I wanted to help as many people as I can, empower people with what I've learned. I want to be of service. My actual name, David Meltzer, means beloved servant. I wanted to live that, not just talk about it. And then finally, I wanted to have the gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability and inspiration to enjoy the cause of it. So I created five daily practices. Number one, I decided every day I would ask myself, what do I want today? Personally, experientially, Giving-wise, productivity-wise, and receiving-wise. What was I going to ask for today? In a trajectory towards what? Mid- and long-term objectives that, by the way, are so scary, so big, so limitless that the hair should raise on your own arms. And people should laugh at you, scoff at you, and make fun of you and say, my mission in life is to live over to be and live over 111 years old and to empower over a billion people. Are you insane? Yes, I am. But I have daily practices based off of what I want today that are extremely realistic. Today's objectives are extremely realistic that lead out to unrealistic midterm and completely ridiculous long-term objectives. And you're allowed to change your mind. I love people that change their mind. One shows me that they're open-minded, which means they're open-hearted and open-handed, but it also tells me they're fast learners. So I love people who say, no, don't want to be a lawyer, I want to be a salesperson. No, I want to do that. Terrific, as long as you know what you want today. Towards that trajectory, change your mind tomorrow from the lessons you learned from today, the realistic objectives you have. Number two, daily practice. Not only should you look at what you want in a trajectory of mid and long-term completely crazy dreams, but you should know two things. Who you can help with what you want and who can help you. See, when you decide what you want every day, it becomes a possibility. Most people go through life like a tube. Food in, food out. No what? Nothing. You can mathematically change your statistical success by simply knowing what you want, which creates a possibility. The minute you know who you can serve and who can serve you, creating community of sponsors and power sponsors. Sponsors are people that know someone that can help you. Power sponsors are people that can help you themselves and know someone that can help you. This community aggregates on itself into creating abundance by creating more efficiencies and helping one another, simply by asking one another, simply by aligning to, this is what I want, do you know who can help me or who I can help? The minute you know the who, it goes from a possibility to a probability because now you're in spirit, you're inspired. When you know your what, it's a possibility. When you know your who, it's a probability, a mathematical advantage. Then the third step after we know the what and the who is how. How? Well, how to get it done is looking through a lens of productivity, how much value can I provide, 
accessibility, how accessible am I to that sponsor and power sponsor group, and how am I accessing what I want? How am I asking, how am I receiving, how am I accessing what I want? Productivity, accessibility, and of course, gratitude. How am I reconciling time with gratitude? Am I spending my time in things that feed me? Am I utilizing my time to find the light, the love, and the lessons in the context of activity I planned, activity I don't have planned, and my sleep? The number one mentor that I have in my life is my sleep coach. I've had her for 16 years. Most people, like I said, go to bed and wake up more tired. I actually know that a third of my life is spent sleeping. I'm going to be productive, accessible, and gracious with my sleep. I recover faster than most people on earth, and I access more while I sleep. My sleep is about recovery and access. My tomorrow starts today. I have an unwinding routine at 9 p.m. I put my mind, my body, and my soul in a position to recover and access. Most people go, how do you wake up at 4 a.m. every day? No. I start my day at 9 p.m. to put myself in a position to recover and access the information I need to plateau and grow by 4 a.m. each day. I do not live my life like the myth of Sisyphus. I do not start my life at the bottom of the hill every day. I plateau and grow. I use my new plateau of potential as a baseline to determine step five, which I'll get to, to determine how and where I'm growing and accelerating. It's a baseline for my day. Know your how, utilizing lenses of productivity, accessibility, and gratitude, you'll be more efficient, effective, and statistically successful with the activity you have planned, the activity you don't have planned, and your sleep. I teach a concept called the student of the calendar. In fact, I know this guy in the white over here who'll be speaking tomorrow, that's one of the key simple strategies that he utilized to increase exponentially his activity that he gets paid for and the activity that he doesn't get paid for because it redetermines what? Your non-negotiables. My non-negotiables, number one priority, my health. The greatest thing about your health is that if you are healthy, you get as many asks as a day as you want. You get as many hopes, wishes, and dreams that you want. Every day if you're healthy. If you're unhealthy, you only have one wish, no matter what you have. So I prioritize my health. I give it a minimum of an hour a day. Then I prioritize my family. So each of the members of my family get a minimum amount of time. I have to stress that because the internet gets crazy when they're like, you only spend two minutes a day with your daughters? No, minimum. And I asked for five, by the way, so F off. Um, <laughs> but I spend a minimum of 30 minutes with my wife every day, seven days a week, 30 minutes with my 12-year-old son, two minutes a day minimum with each of my daughters, three of them, and a minute a day with my mom. If you want to write down the greatest lesson that I've learned that's changed my life and healed my relationship with my mom, by the way, if you tell me you don't have mommy issues, you're lying. I always know that my backup plan in life, if I end up losing everything like I did, by the way, I lost over $100 million and made it back through these lessons. I could do a class called Mommy Issues and everybody would sign up. Um, so how do we heal mommy issues? One, call your mom every day, email, text, or whatever, and just tell her four things. If you tell your mom every day, every single day, for a minimum of a minute, that you're happy, that you're healthy, that you love her, and you appreciate her, that she adds value to your life, it will heal all other BS. Because that's all your mom wants for you, and that's all you want for your children. No more having to drive all the way over there and fix the screen door, even though you could pay someone to fix the screen door, and you wonder why you have to go there to fix the screen door and spend half your day there to fix the screen door. Because you haven't told her that you're healthy, happy, love, and appreciate her. If you tell her that every day, I promise you, it will heal so much of your relationship. Know your what, your who, and your how. There's activity you get paid for, activity you don't get paid for in your sleep. There's activity you have planned and don't have planned. If you know your non-negotiables when things that aren't planned, you'll know exactly where to fit them in. Non-negotiable one, your health. Non-negotiable two, your family. Non-negotiable three, activity you get paid for. A minimum amount of time every day. The fourth daily practice. <sighs> know your now. 100% of the things you do now get done. Most people, the biggest problem they have is they don't know how to prioritize. So they procrastinate and or they feel overwhelmed, especially during COVID. So many of my comments, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm like, oh, you should say thank you. 
They're like, I'm paying you for that? I was like, yeah, because you're living in abundance. You got more than enough to do. You have more than enough people to hang out with you. There's more than enough. People that aren't living in the world of more than enough do not feel overwhelmed. Your problem's prioritization. You don't know what's important to you because you haven't done the work today to figure out what do I want, who can I help, who can help me, and how best to get it done with productivity, accessibility, and gratitude. It's that simple. If you find yourself prioritizing effectively, you know you're doing the work and you will be exponentially more productive, accessible, and gracious. You will make more money, help more people, and have more fun. Prioritization is the antidote to procrastination. Nobody that has correct prioritization is sitting around high on their mom's couch, broke and high, dreaming about what they want. They're actually doing it because they are prioritizing what's important to them. Not what's important to other people, not what's missing, not what they don't want. They're putting their attention and intention, doing, saying, thinking, believing, and feeling exactly what they want, who they can help, who can help them, and how to get it done. And they prioritize effectively. They make decisions quickly because they know what they want, who they can help, who can help them, and how to get it done. There's no wasted time. It's one of the keys of life. If you're not prioritizing, if you have a problem prioritizing, if you procrastinate or feel overwhelmed, then go back and start looking every day at what you want and be very realistic with the what, the who, the how, and the now will change. Last but not least, before I take a little bit of Q&A, if you know the what, the who, the how, and the now, you then shift your entire paradigm of faith. No longer are you trying to go get anything. You simply are clearing the interference between you and everything. That's all you're doing. Whatever you want, you're just clearing the interference <coughs> by what you do say, think, believe, and feel. How do we do that? It's a practice. I call it applying my why. I'm not in search of my why. I make a ton of money off of people that call me and say, Mr. Meltzer, can you help me? I'm in search of my why. I'm graduating this. I'm changing jobs. I'm an entrepreneur. You're in search of something you already have? Right? Have you ever thought you lost your sunglasses and there they were? <laughs> That's where your why is. <laughs> it's the same place. You just got to figure out what you're doing to interfere with knowing where it is so you can allow it to happen. So how do we do it? Four steps. One, practice identifying what you're doing to interfere with it. What does that mean? We have this thing called the ego. <coughs> it's fear-based. For me, I've created a list. Whenever I have a need to be right, I'm interfering with, with my why. I'm interfering with what I want, who I can help, right? Whenever I have a need to be offended. The greatest thing about having a need to be offended, and I have a huge one, is if you have a need to be offended, all you got to do is walk outside. <laughs> it's right there for you. You can be offended over anything. I've wasted so much time, emotion, value, and money, and relationships with a need to be offended and a need to be right. Need to be separate, inferior, superior. A need to be angry, anxious, frustrated, guilty, resentful. Two of my favorite needs of the ego that interfere with me and my potential or what I want. Worrying, the need to worry, and the need to complain. Anybody ever worry? Yeah, worry is a duplicative negative. It's a duplicative interference because not only does it interfere with you and what you want, but it's wishing for what you don't want. I proved that when I took the bar here in Florida. I took uh, the trust in estates, the rules of perpetuity. When I was in that class, I'm like, oh, I hope that rules of perpetuity is not on my final. First question. When I took the bar, I'm like, anything but the rules of perpetuity. First question. There are no coincidences. There's just attention plus intention equals that coincidence. And worrying and complaining are great ways to interfere between you and what you want. It's a great way to draw into your life what's missing or what you don't want. But people do it all day long. Not me. I have a four-step process. I identify the needs of the ego. And then instead of resisting it, using my logic to analyze it, telling myself, don't worry, don't worry. Has that ever helped anyone? Because it won't. Instead of doing that, I actually stop. It's probably one of the most courageous things, disciplined things that I can do is when I am accelerating in the wrong direction through fear-based emotion, instead of resisting it, going over it, under it, through it, around it, lying to it, manipulating or cheating it, I simply stop. It's hard. But if I can stop, then all I'm doing is spending minutes and moments in interference because once I stop, I then breathe through my nose, out through my mouth and drop. Where do I drop to? That baseline where I woke up in the morning. 
that new plateau, my higher self, my better self, my higher potential, taking advantage of complete recovery and access. And then what do I do? Four step, so identify what's interfering, I stop, I drop, then I remind, remember, and recollect. Remind to the greater mind, the greater consciousness, the source, remember, put ourselves as one, recollect as one, remind, remember, and recollect what I want, made it a possibility again, who I can help and who can help me, make it a probability again in my day, remind, remember, and recollect how best to be productive, accessible, and gracious in getting it done, and then confirm it by prioritizing it, that it's important to me, not to somebody else. Urgency can be a subset of importance, but it's absolutely not the crux of your decision of prioritization. Therefore, I'm applying my why. Every single day, I live in ego-based consciousness. The difference is I don't spend days, weeks, months, and years accelerating in the wrong direction. I spend minutes and moments applying my why, living in spirit, inspired. I promise you, if you live with gratitude to give you the right perspective, forgiveness to give you the peace, to live at ease, to identify the dis-ease in everything you do from nutrition to working out to the people and ideas that you surround yourself. If you live in an accountable life, participating in and learning from all the blessings of promotion and protection that may come in forms of pain, setbacks, failures, and mistakes, you will effectively communicate every day not just with everyone that you're connected to and through, but with the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source that loves you more than your mom. And if you do that through those values, you will know your what, the realistic what for you want today, who you can help, who can help you, how to get it done and prioritize correctly so that you're living in your why. I promise you, if you practice this, you will not only make a lot of money, but you will help a lot of people and live every day having fun. You will be able to empower others, to empower others to be happy. And if you do that, it'll make me happy. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can I extend the time a little to answer more questions? Amazing. <laughs> okay, so we have time to answer one or two questions. I am sure that there are at least one or two. If you don't have them, I'm going to monopolize this time. And I will be answering questions later, too. So, just a, a quick one. I, oh, sorry. Thank you. So, I, I'm... I feel like I try to live my life in line with what you're saying. I try to have a vision. I try to make sure that I am expressing gratitude. I find myself sometimes midday or in the middle of a crazy week so far from that. And I know you mentioned expressing gratitude, and that is always the way to get you back to zero very quickly. Is there any kind of special routine you have for that to get you there, or maybe some kind of you know reminder that you set for yourself, whether it's digital, we're all in tech, right? I'm like, hey, can I set a reminder on my phone? <laughs> yeah. well, I actually built a, a gratitude app that has reminders in it. Um, so I think reminders are, are great. Alerts are great, you know, that just say thank you or remind ourselves to thank you. But I also, when you start becoming a student of your calendar, understanding how time is reconciled, the 24 hours of time is reconciled with the inf infinite time. So, for example, patience is a difficult thing. If you understand infinite time and have infinite patience within infinite time, everything happens instantly, which is you know, something that, that I study. To this context, reminders, alerts, pragmatically, being a student of your calendar also is, allows you not to waste that time in the ego-based consciousness of not being grateful, right? Of worrying, complaining, draining yourself, bleeding yourself, and you start identifying real quickly. I always say, my frequency is my neighborhood. So as I'm elevating my frequency, it's amazing what coincidences are occurring in my neighborhood. We all could go sit in the worst places of Orlando and look for opportunities, but in the pragmatic, realistic world, there's less opportunities sitting on a, a park bench in, in the worst neighborhoods in America than there is in my neighborhood walking down the street, meeting people in the park in my gated community in Orange County, 
or sitting around at, at where the school or wherever. There's just more opportunity. Why? Because I've elevated my frequency just like a neighborhood. So in my life, I'm trying to let people that have lower frequency fall away or even fire them from my life. One of the greatest things my wife did for me, we ended up you know, losing over $100 million. She did stay with me. She saved my life. But one of the things I had to promise her for her not to leave me was fire my three oldest friends, not Rob, three of the other guys. And it was amazing when I freed myself of the people that were bleeding me. And I started surrounding myself with the people that fed me. So there's a lot of pragmatic things that you can do, but understanding and identifying through your calendar, believe it or not, utilizing activity at plan and don't have plan, reconciling time, you'll start realizing, why am I wasting my time on this? And that's where the identification of the need to be right or worried. I mean, I wish I could take back all the times I needed to be right, especially in my marriage. I remember being, I've been married 25 years. Early in my marriage, one time we missed an exit and I had to be right. And it ended with me screaming, why did I ever marry you? And I'm probably not the only spouse in the world that has gone crazy with a need to be right or, or offended to the person that I care most about. Thank you. You're welcome. One more. I think we had one in the blue shirt. What question? Oh, there we go. Uh, I guess my question is, you, you talked a lot about focusing on yourself and how you can make those changes. How do you feel we can make that impact on others that perhaps we feel may not show as much gratitude or, you know, how, how can we make that impact on others? and help them change or see, see things differently? That's a great question. So we give meaning to everything that we see. So if we can give meaning to others to see things differently, that's how we get them to change the way they see things so the things they see change. So it's all in the meaning of what we do. So remember, I talked about your neighborhood being your frequency. Not everybody is ready to hear what you have to say. I meet people where they're at. I told you my story. I wasn't ready to hear my dad. I wasn't ready to hear my best friend, Rob. I wasn't ready to hear my wife. But they all planted seeds. You plant seeds under trees sometimes that you may never sit under. And there's a lot of energetic and genetic inheritance, addictions, things that it won't matter what you say. People won't listen to you. And if they are listening to you, they may not hear you. Lou Holtz, the coach at Notre Dame, once said to me, Dave, it's not what I say, it's what they hear because they give meaning to everything I say. But what we can do is consistently, persistently act accordingly. I started, I think, by saying I don't listen to my mom. I watch her. And I still watch her. And, you know, she has planted a lot of seeds uh, that have grown and I and blessed to hopefully have done the same. I will tell you real quickly, and I will take more q and I'll stay after, I'll be back over tonight and I'll do a meetup, do Ask Me Anything, so I love answering questions. Um, but my daughter goes to Indiana University, she's a junior, and she came home and she said, Dad, my professor, he's just like you. He had this quote, it sounds just like you. And I was like, oh really, what is it? And she's like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I said, well, that's funny, because that's my quote. And I've said it to you like a hundred goddamn times. <laughs> but I planted a seed by saying that. And there's no doubt why it resonated with her from somebody else. So continue to plant seeds, continue to walk the walk. And when people are ready, those seeds will sprout. But you cannot tell somebody what to do. It'd be like telling someone to suppress. Oh, it's simple. Look at the glass half full. You got to meet them where they're at, plant the seed. And I do that mainly, and we go over this later. I have an open-ended question guide. I love open-ended questions to allow people at least to start to think. Hey, would it help you if? Hey, what are you doing today? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Would it help you if? Do you know anyone that can help me? Those simple questions in practice will change your life, create a community of sponsors, empower sponsors, plant seeds not in, only in others, but in yourself. What are you doing today? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What do you help you if? And then finally, do you know anyone that could help me? 
simple way to change your life, utilizing a pragmatic template of questions to accept an open mind, open heart, and open hands. Remember, everyone has an open mind, but maybe not at the time you're engaging them. Some people, 90% of the time, they have open minds, so it's easier to catch them at that time. Some people, 10% of the time. But you still can catch them in that moment as well. So my only qualifier in life is, do I have someone at an open mind at this time? And can I figure out what they're doing, what they like, what they don't like, how I can be of service or value, and how they can help me? Simple, mathematical. Yes, sir. I believe I'm a optimist, so uh, if you give meaning to everything you see and you have a perspective of seeing the glass half full, um, I think you know when you pay attention to something and give it intention, you have less interference. So I put it high up on the charts, but I also know that optimism is genetic and energetic inheritance. I was born an optimist. I, I was born it, so you have to meet people where they're at. So. Can we help you look more optimistically on this in a more positive way, more of the time? We can't just assume people that are born into an energetic and genetic, pessimistic, anxious, depressed state of mind and biochemistry that we can just tell them, be optimistical, find the light, the love, and the lessons in this. Look, I believe habits aren't formed in 21 days. I think in minimum, you can create a neural pathway in 21 days, but if you're genetically predisposed to a habit or an addiction, positive or negative, it could take you 21 lifetimes. That's why programs like the 12 steps. Why do you have to confront it every single day? If building a habit only took 21 days, then every, there'd be no alcoholics, right? Or no people who are addicted to nicotine. Because immediately, now, I'm someone that could literally have a drink and never have one again, and my wife is someone who could have a cigarette and never have one again. But for me, if I have, I'm not, I never smoked anything in my life, but I chew tobacco when I was 14. If somebody would give me a pouch of tobacco today, I would be running to the gas station tomorrow. It's gonna take me lifetimes to get over the genetic and energetic inheritance of my tobacco addiction, that, that habit. So being an optimist is part of the journey of learning. And the more optimistic we can be, the better statistical success I think we have in being happy. But I don't expect everyone on earth, that's why if you notice they say, if we can get a billion people to be happy, it'll change the collective consciousness. That still remains seven billion people or so that aren't happy. But it will make a significant impact on speeding up that process. Great question, thank you. All right, everyone, I know we gotta continue the program. I will be around all day and night, so we'll do some more Q&A, if that's right, Jennifer. Yeah, it's absolutely right. So thank you so much, thank it you. was amazing. <laughs> okay, so that everybody is aware. Thank you.